our last speaker, um, I've got a great uh, honor in introducing Edward Snelson, who's a PEM consultant uh, here in the UK. He's uh, done a lot for education here, both face-to-face um, -face education and online education. And he's going to talk to us about his top five PEM papers. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thanks to everybody for coming to this uh, session. Um, you should not let me tell you about five papers in pediatric emergency medicine. What I'm going to talk about is, I'm going to tell you about the, some papers in the context of uh, some, some clinical cases. Um, and when I say you shouldn't let me tell you about those papers, you shouldn't let me tell you what I think about those papers, because I have biases. Yeah? So whenever you let somebody tell you about something, you are allowing their bias to come in. Okay? I'm going to explore a little bit about that. And one of the things I'd like to do is be honest with you about my biases with regard to these five papers and have you thinking a little bit about what your biases are. Okay? So we've been, this, is good, this has been a common theme of this conference that we've been looking at some things. It's interesting because many of you are here to, to, again, hear about some of the same papers that have already been mentioned in other sessions. We've been doing them, but different perspectives. And we are looking at evidence in ways that we haven't done in the past. And this conference, which is very social media friendly, lends its way to a certain way of looking at evidence. And that's one of the other things I'd like to explore. So I'm going to talk about five cases that I might well see on a Tuesday morning in my emergency department, and a little bit about a paper that's relevant to each of those presentations. And I'm going to also not just tell you a little bit about what's in those papers, but a little bit about my response, the human response, the... Everything has to have a catchy acronym, doesn't it? This is, the, this is, this is ORCID. This is... This is the way that I'm looking at my own response to that paper so I can evaluate my biases, my human response. I'll explain what I mean as I go along. So this is Lannister. Uh, Lannister is a four-year-old, and he's come to my emergency department having been treated with inhalers at home overnight. He's had previous episodes of viral wheeze, and he's come and he's working quite hard, and I am treating him with boluses of 10 puffs of salbutamol via a large volume spacer. spacer. And, uh, and he's still wheezy. And I am aware that there is also a discussion to be had about whether or not I give him some steroids. So as we've already heard, there has been a paper uh, it, quite recently all about whether steroids affect uh, wheeze between the ages of two and six. Okay, so this paper was done, and I'm aware, I'm pretty sure, if I can see, somebody in the audience might have been instrumental in uh, uh, bringing that paper about, so nobody warned me about that when I, when I decided to do this session. So this evidence, it, it really talks about the, 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 the benefit of steroid in this age group, which is controversial, um, and, uh, and, and demonstrated a reduced stay in hospital four children between the two, ages of two and six who were given steroids, and uh, a, a stronger benefit in those who have a previous diagnosis of asthma, or who had severe work of breathing, or who had been given inhalers before they attended hospital. So I'm aware of that evidence. I know about that. But I need to think about, you know, how do I translate into practice? It incorporates all sorts of biases, environmental biases, personal biases, um, what I want to believe, what I don't want to believe. So I come back to ORCID, so evaluating my own response to this. What I've done is take that to another level and developed a machine which tells me about my own response, because I can't even be objective about my own response. And the machine is the ORCIDometer. So let's look at what the ORCIDometer says about my response to this paper. And it tells me that I found it contradictory and confusing. Why is it contradictory and confusing? Well, it's because there was previous evidence that suggested something different, suggests that steroids don't work in that. It's confusing because I'm trying to understand what, what I actually believe about wheezing in that age group. Do I believe that it's all about treating children by age, 
Do I believe it's about recognizing phenotypes and directing my therapy towards that phenotype? Because whenever the research is designed, it has to jump one way or the other. Often it's age-based, because that's a lot easier to do in research, rather than identifying phenotypes, which is really difficult, but we do that in clinical practice. What do I do with this evidence? It's actually different from the way that I think, and I'm trying to apply that evidence in my clinical practice. So, that's paper number one. Next patient of the morning. This child is three weeks old, and has come in looking really, I think you'll agree, quite well, but a history of having had a temperature at home, documented, properly done, say 38.5. Yeah? And knowing what I know about children of this age group, that makes me feel very uncomfortable, because I know that the risk of serious bacterial infection, especially invasive infection, the risk of that in this age group is especially high. But I also know that a lot of these children will turn out to have nothing at all wrong with them. A lot. Risk is high. The consequences of missing them are high. So it would be really nice if I had a way of determining which to treat and which not to treat. Which comes on to my next paper, which is a paper about febrile children under the age of 60 days and a decision tool which evaluates uh, the, the risk of serious bacterial infection. And in this study, they took, looked at three things. They looked at absolute neutrophil count, they looked at procalcitonin, looked at urine results, and by finding all three to be negative, essentially to paraphrase the results of that study, showed that the risk if, of serious bacterial infection goes from uh, about 1 in 10 to about 1 in 500. That's pretty amazing. You know, essentially what they're saying is, if you currently treat everybody, and you started to use this, you could treat just the ones who test positive, and of the rest, you'd have to treat 500 of them to pick up a missed case using this screening tool. That's pretty good. So, what happens when I try and evaluate my response to this? Again, the orchidometer will tell me what I'm going to do next. It tells me this is a very exciting study because it's really, really strong evidence and it's really, really applicable, but it's completely unachievable for me because I do not have procalcitonin in my hospital. Yeah? And it was very interesting when this paper came out and people started to discuss this, that you started to see people have exactly that same thought process and say, we'll just use CRP instead. Hmm. <sighs> Interesting. It showed how much people wanted to use this because it's so, uh, so good a piece of evidence and it tells us about some way that we could do what we're doing better. But it was dangerous because we don't know, because the purist, if you are an academic, and I'm not one, the academic would say, but the study didn't use CRP, so you're now fudging it. Yeah? It'd be interesting to hear from you when we have questions and discussions whether any of you are using this in practice, or if any of you are using a sort of hybrid version of this where you've, uh, where, where you've used absolute neutral count urine and CRP instead. So that's my second paper. Next. This young lady, Khaleesi, has come and uh, she banged her head yesterday and she's attended with a head injury, but she didn't come straight away. She's come the day after, over 24 hours later. Now, you may or may not know this, but all the decision rules that you have for head injured children deciding when to scan them are based on data sets of presentations in the first 24 hours. So if you're going to make a decision about whether young Khaleesi needs to have her head scanned, you shouldn't be using those tools. Now, there was, very helpfully last year, a published uh, paper about delayed presentations and head injuries. So that's really nice that somebody looked at a large cohort of children who presented after 24 hours with head injuries, and quite rightly, they are looking for 
traumatic brain injury and clinically significant traumatic brain injury. In other words, we want to know the cases where it actually made a difference doing a scan, which is not the same as finding an abnormality. Okay. So what did they find? They found that well, it was, a, it, was a, it was a paradox, because on the one hand, delayed presentation had a higher incidence of significant traumatic brain injury than presentation in the first 24 hours. On the other hand, it showed that for those delayed presentations, the, the only things that were consistently found with the patients who did have traumatic brain injury were depressed skull fractures, or clinical signs of, or a non-frontal hematoma. In other words, in their set of patients, if you did not have an abnormality on the head, a non-frontal hematoma, or a signs of a depressed skull fracture, none of the patients in that study had a clinically significant traumatic brain injury. So interesting. So I said, it's a bit of a paradox. What do I do with that? Well, I asked the orchidometer before I decide what I'm going to do about it. What does the orchidometer tell me? It tells me it's actually very relevant, it's very applicable, and it's a little bit meta. It teaches me a little bit about why people present with head injuries and what it means when they present with head injuries. So in other words, I'm taking that evidence and I'm thinking, so the patients who present in the first 24 hours are less likely to have a traumatic brain injury. That doesn't surprise me. A lot of people worrying because they bump their heads and there's not a lot wrong with them. They tell us that, they examine themselves, they come in and you know there's nothing wrong with them. Tells me about parents who come the next day are already filtered out the ones who weren't going to worry from just the bump on the head. So they're now going to come with a more significant concerns. So probably that's why you've got a higher incident of traumatic brain injury, because the people who are warriors come on day one. The people who find something later to worry about come on day two potentially. And it tells me that if you're going to have a symptom of your head injury that necessitates a scan, it's probably going to happen in the first 24 hours. And that the 24 hours later, the indication for a scan, scan might be that there is signs of a depressed skull fracture or signs of a uh, skull fracture from a non-frontal hematoma. And that otherwise, you know, we've talked about vomiting and head injury already, it's unlikely to... Even if, the, even if it is due to the head injury, it's unlikely to be the case that by doing a scan, we're going to find something that we need to do an operation for or changes our clinical management. We can manage symptoms without a scan. So that was the next one. Next one, we've already touched on this. The two, two studies, actually, but Eclipse in Concept, looking at uh, Levetiracetam versus, or Keppra, it's much easier to pronounce that, Keppra, versus phenytoin in status epilepticus. So I now know that there have been two studies that have uh, demonstrated that there's probably no difference between the two in terms of second-line treatment for status epilepticus. What was my response to that? I felt a bit liberated, actually. Um, uh, a lot of people before that were absolutely convinced that their way was the best way. And who here works in pediatric emergency medicine? Yeah, okay. So there's lots of other people. It's nice to get people from all sort of backgrounds. But if you work, if, you, if your recess room is part of your day-to-day -day work, you know that there's that moment where people come in a crisis and there's nothing worse than three very, very clever people in a room, each of whom believes that, that their way is absolutely the right way and they're all disagreeing with each other. Yeah, so this is, this is nice. This kind of means that I know that there isn't one particular right way, that actually both ways are the right way. That's, for me, that's really nice. Because before then, people were absolutely convinced that their way was better than their, somebody else's way, and there was no evidence to say wh who was right. Now we know none of them were right. <laughs> on the other hand, we also have to acknowledge, that, like we, we've already touched on, the guidelines are still often, depending on where you work, not yet caught up with this and haven't included this. So to say you have choices, or indeed to say out of those choices, we believe that, this, that, that although they're both as effective each other, there are reasons to choose one over the other. I think 
although we sort of touched on that before, and whether or not it's a, uh, it's, it's a difficult situation to be in because the guidelines take a long time to change. There is also the case that you can be too reactive to evidence, and sometimes it is good to have a period of digestion after evidence comes out in order to decide what the best way forward is. You can be overreactive, you can also be too slow. Three to four years to change your guideline is too slow. Finally, this young patient has been hit by a car, pedestrian versus car, comes into my recess room with multiple injuries. I know that in pediatric emergency medicine now, we have very much moved towards a, a way of thinking about imaging in major pediatric trauma of very selective CT scanning. The mantra really now, they talk about ALARA, as low as reasonably achievable in terms of radiation dose. And the way that we achieve that is by choosing for each body part, does this bit need to be scanned and why? Being very careful about that. But I know not everybody's doing that. And sometimes people will hear the, but they were hit by a bus, and therefore we must scan everything. And sometimes that happens. And it's not always wrong, but it is often the case that you can be much more selective about your CT scanning. But again, you don't always get agreement amongst everybody. You know, for example, you might find that I make one decision, and then when they go to pediatric critical care, people will feel anxious about the fact that a particular body part wasn't scanned. And so what ends up happening is that they have a whole body CT, but it's strip teased. They do it a bit at a time. Like the TV show, Naked Attraction. They get little bits, and by the time you finish, the whole body's been CT'd. So last year, they published a, a, a very, very large Japanese study, uh, 10 years worth of the entire nation's uh, C, pediatric CT scanning in, in pediatric major trauma. So they had two groups, one lot who had whole body CT and the other lot who had, and they weren't randomized, they were looking at disparity in practice, but they were managing to, within those groups, match the cohorts. They're doing, they were just doing age, sex, and injury matching. Um, and uh, what they found was that there was no difference in terms of mortality between the group who had a whole body CT and those who had selective CT which suggests very strongly that selective CT is safe and that when somebody says to you, but I think we should do everything, when the original impression was that we could be selective, then it is nice to have something that validates that. And of course, having something like that, which confirms your current practice, is lovely. If that's what you're already doing and having a piece of evidence to be able to back that up, it's nice because you can quote it. It's nice because it tells you about, uh, tells you about uh, what you're doing already and confirms that. But I'll tell you something to finish off with. This paper, when I read it, guess how far I got into it before I decided I'd made my decision? Yeah, pretty much. Abstract. Coming back to... Somebody called Meredith wrote us a paper about steroids and viral weeds. Guess how much red pen was involved in looking at that study? A lot. Read it five times, went through it, finding lots of flaws, tons of flaws. But that's me, that's my bias. And that is why you should not let me tell you about five papers in pediatric emergency medicine. That's why you should read five papers and ask yourself, what your orchidometer would say, which ultimately is a tool for assessing the bollocks that you bring to assessing evidence. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Um, so, I don't know, I've lost Ian with the microphone, he's in the corner, so hands up, and while Ian's finding someone with a question, we've got a couple coming through on Twitter. Yeah, so uh, we've got one uh, talking uh, from uh, Laura Hole at Holy Doc, 
Um, she asks, is head injury less worrying if it presents more than 24 hours later, and is this true in NAI? They might be at higher risk and could be missed, especially if they're less than one year of age. So do we need to look at that population differently? Yeah, so uh, that was one of the things that was discussed in the paper, which is why, again, it's, uh, it's quite useful to go and actually read the paper in full. Um, inevitably, uh, delayed presentations will include a significant uh, cohort of non-accidental injuries. And although we should think about it, it is not in itself evidence of non-accidental injury. Um, but it is always something that should make us think more carefully about that, definitely. Um, and there was one other question as well. It come through from uh, PECC Africa, so the research group uh, we've mentioned before. Um, and they want to know, did any of, I think it's sort of a group question maybe, did any of these studies talk about cost of intervention or cost per child investigated or value-based care in any fashion? We, we, looked, we looked a little bit at um, cost savings with, or travel saving, so by extension cost savings. Uh, directed at families and for the uh, undescended testis paper uh, and the, the data aren't published yet but hopefully shortly um, and essentially we, we there's a trade-off we have to decide if we're going to bring a whole bunch of patients down with a booking for surgery recognizing that for some of those patients they will be cancelled on the day so those families had to come down anyway to be assessed but there's a cost to the theatre because there's downtime potentially. Now in my hospital that's not such an issue because the emergency board is always a nightmare. Um, against uh, getting those families to travel more than once. So often when you're talking about cost, the, the question is cost to whom? Um, and, and, is it, uh, and who's more important? Is it cost to the family or is it cost to the, the service that's more important? And you just have to make those you have to make those judgment calls. Fabulous. Um, anyone in the audience who's got any questions? So maybe not. You've got ten, nine, eight, no, okay. So no questions from the audience. Um, so just a huge thank you to these three and to Richard, who um, I think all oh, is there one on Twitter? One more. one more, okay, one more. One more time. Um, so that's from this is from uh, Naphead at Norwich P uh, PEM, Norwich PEM. Um, they ask how do you suggest we attempt to overcome the time it takes for guidelines to catch up with evidence? Um, Very good. This is a more pressing issue now in the digital age. So uh, this is, this is uh, the, the, the issue of the digital age, I think, is, is obviously hugely relevant at a conference like this. Um, uh, it is, I'm sure, driving change, the discussions that I had on social media, and quite rightly too, I think it's really great that the, you know, I say, get up there and say, I shouldn't be telling you what to think, but also you shouldn't let experts tell you what to do necessarily. Um, it, we should be involved in the conversation, and the way that we're doing that, I think, is really good, getting the voice heard of, uh, of jobbing clinicians. It's, sometimes there is an expectation that things are really reactive, and sometimes that reaction is based on headlines, so we talked about me just reading the abstract. There is nowhere where that is more true than when people are involved in uh, discussions on social media about new bits of evidence. Um, I was very fascinated to see uh, a discussion that happened earlier this year where Damien ended up jumping in at one point saying, guys, this study isn't even published yet, and we're talking about the results and what we're going to do with the results because somebody's told us what the results were online before it was even published. Um, and, and, and sometimes it, there, there is a little bit of sort of holding on to our horses. Um, but at the same time, I, I think that we will inevitably, by having, uh, by having a more visible online presence and discussing what we see as uh, the relevance of this evidence in practice, hopefully drive a change in ways that didn't used to happen. Guide, guidelines are for the guidance of the wise and the strict obedience of fools. Um, but I, I wonder if this is where our trainees have a role to play. If we can create respectful environments where trainees are empowered to challenge the decisions of their seniors, uh, our trainees, by virtue of the imperative of impending exams, they're often more across the research than we are. Mm. We, get, we get used to doing things in certain ways. And we hope that those ways are still accurate and are still 
correct, but sometimes they're not. And if we can create an environment where our trainees are happy to ask, question, challenge, we create an environment that values education and discourse and, uh, and, and questioning, then maybe that will change the way we think and act. Here, here. Okay. So last second opportunity for any last questions. I think we're probably at a close and I think people are hungry. So would everyone join me in uh, applauding these guys?